Hello, everybody. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to welcome everyone here in person and online. Uh, my name is Jonathan Wurtzen. I'm an associate professor in sociology, and I'm a member of the Council on Middle East Studies. And it's really uh, a pleasure today to be able to welcome Ian McGallivray to uh, give us a talk. Um, Ian is a Fox Fellow here at Yale this year, but he is also a, a, a doctoral student, uh, finishing his doctoral degree at the School of uh, Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Uh, he's been doing research uh, and uh, foreign policy writing analysis, et cetera, uh, for over a decade uh, with a lot of expertise uh, more towards the Middle East and particularly towards Turkey. Um, and today it's, it's really great to be able to have you share your research with us. It's been wonderful to have you here this, this year as a, as a guest and as a part of our community. And so we all look forward to this. For those of you that are, are online, the format will, will have the talk um, from Ian, and then we'll also, it'll be opened up um, for questions and answers. And so we'll be entering that interactive back and forth and I'll be kind of facilitating uh, that part. So hand it over to you, Ian, thanks. Great. Just share my screen here and then we can get started. Um, hi everybody, firstly, thank you to Jonathan for introducing me there and for being a good mentor for me here at, the, um, at Yale University. Um, also, thank you to the Council of Middle East Studies for having me uh, speak today on my what will be pretty much a summary of my kind of PhD research so far. Um, so my name is Ian McGilvray. Um, as Jonathan pointed out, I'm a PhD candidate at the School of Social Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne and I'm currently a Yale Fox Fellow uh, for another about six weeks. But um, it's a pleasure to come here today and have a chat and just be able to kind of give you all a bit of a summary of what I've been looking at. Um, throughout my PhD research over the last four years. Um, and what a tumultuous couple of years it's been. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is just basically break the talk up into three sections. So the first section is gonna give you kind of the nuts and bolts of the kind of the research that I'm conducting. Just give you the kind of research question, the methodology, an introduction of kind of key concepts, um, what I'm looking at particularly um, to just give you a pretty much the scaffold of what I'm going to be looking at. The second part is going to be looking more at kind of a historical understanding of Turkish foreign policy to help frame the period that I'm looking at, um, as that's very important in the way that we can the, conduct this research. And then, of course, the final part, the findings so far, uh, you know, the, the final hypothesis that I hope to kind of come to. And of course, um, the last part of my thesis, which I will not have time to kind of discuss today, um, which is looking at another uh, another case study. but that's possibly for another time, or you can ask me the questions there. So my talk today is obviously on Turkish foreign policy. And so I wanna give a bit of context for those who aren't very aware of Turkish foreign policy in 2021. Um, well, it's 2022 now, but I don't wanna get stuck in talking about Russia, Ukraine. That's a whole <laughs> other kettle of fish, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that come from that. But basically the scope of my thesis is looking from back to the beginning of the Republic in 1923 up to 2021. And we can see in 2021, the Turkish foreign policy doesn't really have any clear foreign policy objectives. It's somewhat reactionary, it's somewhat erratic, it's very defensive. Um, you know, we see a lot of the kind of turbulence coming from the centralized executive presidency and through kind of the whims of uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. We've seen particularly since the Arab Spring, since 2011, really kind of dramatic changes in Turkish foreign policy direction. So, you know, we see a failure of their Syrian policy up to 2014. The Turkish um, AKP regime has been very prominent in the overthrow of Assad, the Assad regime, um, but has un been unable to this day to, to be able to overthrow that regime, leading to kind of a stalemate um, in Syria. We can also see there's been an ideological projection of Turkish foreign policy, this idea of the Turkish model originally, you know, this idea of a Muslim democracy with a strong neoliberal economy. Uh, then, of course, into kind of more regional power projection, and then, of course, into more kind of hard power uh, projection. Consequently, as part of this, we see kind of stronger relationships with more kind of revisionist powers in the region, and of course, globally. And this is we're looking at particularly Iran and, of course, Russia. And this relationship now obviously plays into the Russia-Ukraine thing. I'm obviously not gonna talk about that, but it's a very poignant fact that we can look at the relationship of Russia and Turkey today and what's happening in the Ukraine war. And of course, we see particularly in the post-Arab spring period, 
these operations and consolidation of territory, particularly in northern Syria, so this use of kind of military power, which has been the first time Turkey's been doing this since 1974 with the Cyprus issue. Um, and of course, what's interesting is this increased relationships with kind of jihadist groups, with uh, opposition figures, the arming of kind of violent non-state actors, external civil society actors, for example, motorcycle gangs over in Germany, um, and of course, uh, transnational uh, Islamist groups like Ikhwan, like Muslim Brotherhood, and of course, Kurdish actors with the new uh, renewed political mobilization of actors like uh, the PYD in Syria, and of course, uh, the YPG. So, you know, we can see there's been all these kind of dramatic changes. So the question that I was looking at, I was like, okay, we look at Turkish foreign policy now, and there's all these dramatic changes, and it's all kind of all over the place. And, you know, a lot of the kind of discourse and policy discussions about Turkey is, is it's always kind of sat firmly within the kind of Western orbit. And, you know, there's a lot of discussions that Turkey has now kind of moved from an axis shift from West to East, or it's pursuing a Eurasian, Eurasianist foreign policy. But actually, I wanted to see, well, what's the key event where we can see where these key changes occur? And so for that, I thought it was the Arab Spring. Um, so the Arab Spring, and I'll explain that in a, in a later slide, why this is important, but I wanted to examine whether the Arab Spring, you know, these initial protests up to, of course, the continuing, uh, you know, up to about 2016 with the Syrian civil war, how has this been a per, um, powerful force in Turkey's state reformation, its state society dynamics, and of course, foreign policy formation. Now, this research is going to shed light on Turkey's foreign policy trajectory from 2020, uh, sorry, 2023, 1923 <laughs> to 2021. And we want to look at those kind of structures and social forces within the Turkish state and its effect on foreign policy throughout its history. And also vice versa, how these structures and social forces have actually shaped foreign policy throughout its history. Again, we're going to be looking at these two case studies. So the first one that I'll be looking and focusing on today is looking on Turkey's traditional foreign policy formation. So how has the Arab Spring affected this? And then because this is obviously firmly situated in kind of the international relations literature, um, I'm basically saying that like traditional and mainstream IR theories can't really provide the answers that we're looking for when we're looking at an event like the, the Arab Spring, a transnational event. So neorealism, constructivism, and liberalism, these kind of give one kind of face of the cube. So to kind of provide more nuance, provide a little bit more, I hate using this word, but holistic uh, <laughs> understanding of Turkish foreign policy is to look at global historical sociology. So the work of kind of Julian Goh and George Lawson to help guide this analysis. Now, this, this research is not trying to to bring new insights of historical sociology into IR, but is using concepts to help us understand and draw out a lot more analysis of Turkish foreign policy. So the key question that I wanna ask was of course, how did the Arab Spring affect Turkish foreign policy, if at all? So is this the key contingent event that changes Turkish foreign policy that explains all these changes that have happened? And of course, there's a couple of sub questions there that kind of help draw out those kind of findings a little bit more. So my initial hypothesis looking at this research was to say, yes, the Arab Spring was this critical moment in helping us understand the changing the social world and structures in Turkish foreign policy. It is this moment in which the revolutionary events and this transnational effects of the revolution, of the revolutionary processes of the Arab Spring shape and change foreign policy formation. So the Arab Spring is a key global event. It is a key global process which changes the structures and formation of Turkish foreign policy and starts new institutional path dependencies and relational structures. Although, as you'll see from my talk, that is not correct. <laughs> um, so you, you're probably asking why the Arab Spring. Now, for a lot of people here listening on the webinar today, and thank you very much for tuning in, and for all the uh, Middle East colleagues here, the Arab Spring is a kind of critical event in the Middle East. You know, it's one of these events that for a long time, other scholars, uh, particularly IR scholars, didn't see the, the, the Middle East ever changing. It had these ossified authoritarian regimes. It was, it was impervious to the transnational effects of social movements. Authoritarianism in its old ossified way would continue. 
But as we saw with the Arab Spring revolutionary movements in particularly beginning in Egypt and Tunisia and moving throughout the region that this actually brought around a large transnational revolutionary social movements throughout the region. Now, of course, there's a lot of domestic considerations that we talk about with the Arab Spring, but there is of course a transnational quality to this and a global quality to it, the revolutionary events. And you know, these revolutionary events have had huge impacts on the state society dynamics and relations in the Middle East. Consequently, these have led to kind of state reformation processes and state formation processes. Concurrently though, these kind of changes have led to counter revolutionary movements and new forms of state formation as we see within Egypt. And of course, with the Gulf countries who kind of uh, stopped the kind of push from these kind of revolutionary movements. And there's been, of course, from this kind of new forms of neo-authoritarian state formation to kind of counteract any kind of uh, revolutionary fervor coming from the Arab Spring. And we also see consequently state failure in places like Syria, Libya, and Yemen. And of course, with coming with state fair and a loss of state structure and power, we see conflicts in the region. And as such, regional and international actors come into these conflicts to pursue their own aims and their goals, uh, to make friendly regimes, or to make sure they can deal in the spoils of after the war in terms of rebuilding, etc. So this makes us think of this as a contingent and a conjunctural event in Turkish foreign policy. And the reason why behind this is that Turkey's engagement with the revolutionary movement in the Arab Spring period is particularly unique. Turkey, unlike the counter-revolutionary actors of Egypt and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, actually shifted from having strong economic relationships with these regimes, for example, in Syria with the Assad regime, which was kind of the crown jewel of the time, to then, of course, supporting the revolutionary movements and somewhat being on the right side of history. And then this support has moved from ideological support, financial support to, of course, hard military support throughout its history. So, and again, we see with the Arab Spring, Turkey becoming more assertive in its regional policy, engaging in the Syrian war, leading the vanguard and trying to overthrow the Assad regime. And of course, becoming more and more pronounced in regional disputes as we see now, particularly in the Mediterranean, uh, we see Turkish foreign policy engaging in far-flung conflicts like in Libya, and of course, supporting uh, allies like in the nagano kabarak uh, conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan by, funnily enough, using violent non-state actors and Syrian opposition figures. So does this make the Arab Spring a critical moment in Turkish foreign policy change? And that's exactly what I'm going to be looking at. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about the literature because, you know, again, PhD students, we kind of get stuck talking about <laughs> literature, review, literature reviews. But basically what I'm saying is that when we look at these kind of understandings in Turkish foreign policy, particularly neorealism and of course constructivism, there's this tendency towards a historicism and a temporalism. And there's also this kind of reification of the realm of the international rather than examining the co-constitutions between these different scales. And of course, when we look at sociology and domestic level interpretations of Turkish foreign policy, they kind of fall into this eye, you know, the, the constant bug in academic literature about methodological nationalism. So to overcome these, this is where I employ concepts from global historical sociology. And I've built on this from my own research previously on Turkish-Iran relations, um, which uh, basically looks at a kind of historical analysis of those relations over history. So conceptual framework, again, not going to get stuck down on this too much, but we're looking at trying to understand and overcome the ahistorical and the atemporalism of international relations theory, and of course, the analysis of Turkish foreign policy. At the same time, we're trying to overcome methodological nationalism of sociology and domestic level approaches. So instead of looking at the in and politic and the domestic as a factor in what happens on the outside, or the factor of the international being the key factor of defining what happens on the inside, we're actually looking at the co-constitution across multiple scales. So we'll be looking at kind of the global, we'll be looking at the national, and of course the local, and the co-constitution. These are just, they're not distinct realms, they kind of relate to each other. There's a relationality between them. And this is, of course, where I use a, a, sorry, a relational ontology to examine the co-constitution of these different scales. And then applying sociological concepts, we're looking at kind of institutional path dependency to help us understand foreign policy. We're looking at the eventfulness of events like Arab Spring and other key events throughout history. We're looking at the historical, the temporal understanding of Turkish foreign policy. So looking at Turkish foreign policy as a historically changing object throughout time. It's an entity in motion as such.
And this, of course, lets us create a grander long durée or narrative of Turkish foreign policy that shapes state processes, foreign policy formation, of course, the power networks that operate within. So just a couple of concepts to make it easier because you know this can get quite bogged down in jargon, so I don't want to but get everyone kind of confused. But the kind of key ones I'll be looking at today is obviously we need to understand the state. Now, the state is not the kind of key. It is one of many key variables in this. I don't like using the word variable, but it's one of these key units of analysis because we need to understand the state as one kind of area or arena. It's basically a combination of institutions with a crisscross of power networks. So again, it's one of these multiple scales that we're analyzing. We're also gonna be in the kind of key sociological part we're gonna be looking at is this idea of interest groups. So individuals or collectives that promote their own interests and use power networks to further their aims and they have a social base in society. So of course, social power and social forces help change this. And the key thing you'll hear me talk about when we talk about the research next is this idea of coalitions. So I've abstracted this to help us understand the kind of relational dynamics throughout history between the kind of key interest groups I usually grouped in these things called coalitions. Now these are fluid groupings. They're not set in history. They have different interest groups that move between them, but the interaction between these coalitions helps drive the processes and change throughout Turkish foreign policy. And of course, state reformation. So the key groups I look at is of course, is a Kamalist, um, Kamalist kind of coalition. This looks at kind of those initial state reformers, these kind of groupings, bureaucrats, military officers, um, educated young people back in the day, uh, economic elites. And then of course, the antithesis of that is of course the conservative coalition. This brings in other groups who kind of sit on the periphery. We could look at kind of the idea of the center periphery um, relationality that you talk about with, for example, Sheriff Martin. And then of course we have the Kurdish grouping. Now this is of course sits on the outside, but has a relation between these two groups. And of course that relationship shapes its dynamics within the state and within foreign policy. Of course, global, this is kind of the key events that we look at, the events, the processes, the changes at a global and transnational level outside the state. Um, quickly, research design, it's a qualitative analysis, it's a historical analysis, so secondary sources, historical uh, interpretations, a smattering of primary sources like economic and trade data. The key thing we're doing here, and what I've done with my analysis is we do this method by David Blagden, it's called induction, deduction and induction. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm dumping all the empirical evidence of Turkish foreign policy over a long period of time. I'm then abstracting that evidence, finding causal patterns, and then injecting the kind of uh, empirical evidence back in to prove and show that causality throughout history. And consequently as well, using things like counterfactual discussion. You know, if I'm saying the Arab Spring is such a key event, then what happens if it wasn't then? Would Turkish foreign policy be the same? So looking at these hypotheticals as a way of helping understand the analysis. So that's the first part done, the nuts and bolts, the boring academic part. Now I'm looking to give you a bit of a rundown of kind of helping understand Turkish foreign policy along a longer historical trajectory. So we can see that throughout Turkish history, particularly in foreign policy, after the initial process of state formation in the 1930s, Turkish foreign policy has remained relatively stable until the end of the Cold War. And then of course, there's massive changes with the election of the AKP. We see uh, a neutrality in World War II. We see it being part of the bipolar order uh, post 1950 with NATO membership. And it sits firmly within this kind of Western orbit until the, um, the fall of the Soviet Union, of course, a reevaluation of Turkey's place within the world. <clears throat> and the key processes and key things we see, particularly when it comes to foreign policy, is that the military and bureaucracy is part of this kind of coalition, this Kamala's coalition. So these kind of uh, military officers, groups, bureaucracy, they're dominated by these interest groups within them, um, drew their social power from elite and entrenched economic base. But uh, these kind of key interest groups and actors help us shape foreign policy. And of course, they are about the reproduction, uh, production and reproduction of institutions and power to maintain the Kamala's coalition's power throughout history and within the state. So while we have an engagement, particularly in 1950s, with the kind of multi-party uh, multi democracy coming in, the Kamala's coalition maintains its power base um, through 
institutional path dependencies, through creation of institutions, through utilization of things like military coups to maintain its power. So we can see this kind of relational dynamic between the conservative coalition, which is trying to, of course, enter the state and, of course, achieve its aims and its interests. And then, of course, the Kamala's coalition, which is trying to deny the conservative coalition from coming in so it can then reproduce its own power and it does it through institutions. And we can see this, of course, in other institutions in the state, for example, the executive, we see this in the judiciary, we see that, you know, even in kind of welfare and these kind of things. But when we look at foreign policy formation, these are reproduced through things like uh, diplomats, um, foreign policy officials. Um, you know, these are drawn from the Kamala's drop. They're educated in institutions that reproduce the power of the Kamala's block. And I put the example here, the Mukie, which is, of course, former, the former institute at Anch Ankara University, which is no longer in existence. But these kind of institutions reproduce their power and they reproduce these structures, these relationship relations, this dialectic between the kind of conservative and the Kamala's control of the state. So this kind of, we see this driver throughout history when it comes to it. And one particular institution when we look at foreign policy that's very important is the evolution of the National Security Council, which is a military organization, which then, of course, um, changes and shifts its power after every coup. So it gets stronger and stronger after thing as it maintains a more kind of authoritarian hold over Turkish foreign policy. And again, when we look at the global, you know, we've got a bipolar system, we've got a NATO membership that helps reproduce military dominance and help continue the Kamala's blocks, aims and interests in the state. So it draws resources. It allows these global changes in the world, allow it to create new institutions. Uh, it allows it to engage in the global field. Uh, it allows it to kind of stop certain interest groups from coming into the state. And, you know, we can even talk about other ones like particularly Marxists or leftists, particularly after 1980. We can see that the global is a key kind of scale which helps reproduce power for the Kamala's block throughout its history but this all changes and this is the kind of key part of the analysis I'm looking at so we're looking of course in 2002 after a massive financial crisis the AKP the Justice and Development Party takes the kind of lead as the political party and is a um, takes the kind of mantle and vanguard of this conservative coalition Moreover, unlike previous iterations, political parties that had worked within this coalition to, of course, access the state, the AKP was able to bring in other social basis and interest groups from other coalitions, particularly from the Kamala's coalition, that allowed it to take power. And for the first time, unlike other, for example, Islamically oriented parties or right wing parties, this coalition, um, the AKP was able to form single government. Now, there has been, of course, Islamist parties. Throughout time, um, you know, when we look at the Refa Pathsa or we look at, um, you know, those associated with the uh, national outlook. Uh, but this is the first time for a long time that the AK, that a party, particularly, well, the first time ever, that a party from the conservative coalition actually comes to power, has a majority power. And of course, with that comes the ability to shape and change society. So there is a slow process of becoming more conservative, religious oriented policies. These kind of things, increases in religious schooling. This is obviously taking on from the 1980s where we, elect, we see kind of more the conservative coalition becoming more entrenched in the state. But the way that the, one of the key aspects of the conservative coalition's view and kind of aims is of course to, to usurp, not essentially usurp, but kind of overtake the Kamala's control of the state, allowing itself and its, of course, interest groups within its coalition to come into the state to, of course, deal with the, the benefits, the material benefits, the economic benefits, the political benefits, and of course, the outcomes when it comes to foreign policy. And one of the key processes we see is, of course, the EU membership process. This is the one critical event and using the kind of global to change the state structure, state society dynamics within Turkey. So the EU membership process changes civil military relations, it brings an end to the kind of the coup, the, the kind of military tutelage, if you want to call it that, this kind of coups, because it causes reformation of institutions like the National Security Council. Um, you know, we can see that brings in other actors, it brings in think tanks, it brings in NGOs, it democratizes foreign policy. So it actually opens up the state more to kind of the social forces and global forces around the world, rather than this kind of tight authoritarianism that had kind of been there for quite a long time. 
But the problem with this, though, as we see as the AKP's kind of tenure continues on, is that this battle, this kind of relational structure between the Conservative Coalition and the Kamala's Coalition drives the AKP to adopt similar positions and similar tactics as the Kamala's Coalition did. So what this means, you know, continued battles against the establishment, the bureaucracy, the military, the security, increases the paranoia of the AKP. So instead of democratization, as we see at the beginning, we instead see institutional capture. And this, of course, leads to fracturing within its own co the conservative coalition as well, as we go on in time. How are we doing for time? Okay, good. Um, so again, we can see here, you know, the capturing of institutions, we can see that it becomes more democratized. But essentially what it does is the AKP to overcome these, these in, you know, impositions in the way it wants to form the state, and of course, undermine the power of the Kamala's coalition, is of course to create alternative institutions. And it does this through other means in other areas of the state. But in terms of foreign policy, we can see it centralized around political offices. We can see the adoption of um, what's called like loyalist interpositions. And we also see particularly um, new educational schemes to adopt and take diplomats from other schools rather than from the MOOC years. There's of course this kind of re-evaluation, re-changing of the kind of dominance, political dominance within these institutions and shaping and, and creating new alternative institutions. And of course, this creates new relational relationships and structures in terms of foreign policy because of this political dominance and alternative institutions. And of course, we see the AKP use other interest groups to help undermine the military or the Kamala's coalition's thing through, like, for example, the Gurnakan or the Beiros trials, you know, through the judiciary particularly. And of course, so all this kind of state reformation processes are going on. They're all changing from the EU process. And you can probably see what I'm saying is that actually, if we look back, it's actually the EU process that really starts this process from going on. But then we have the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring happens, Turkish foreign policy. We see these changes happening. We see that Turkish foreign policy essentially is changing the state. We're taking away, we're, we're recruiting new diplomats. They're recruiting new diplomats. They're creating alternative, uh, um, alternative institutions, but what they're also doing is undermining the kind of um, expertise in the state to deal with foreign policy challenges. So when we come to the Arab Spring, the key way that the um, AKP and its conservative coalition tries to put forward an idea is of course with an ideological projection of, of power in foreign policy. And this is where we see the Turkish model. Um, again, you know, this is a, a proponent to see whether other states would take on Turkey's model throughout the thing in the post-revolutionary period. Consequently, as well, we see in 2013 a domestic um, sort of uh, situation, which is a response to the change in state reformation. We see the Gezi protests. And the Gezi protests obviously speed up the AKP's kind of paranoia and its institutional capture because it's seen as a kind of a threat to its institutional control. Um, I say here possibly inspired by the Arab Spring, like this is, you know, again, this is looking at the transnational qualities. The Gezi protest obviously has a lot of domestic considerations for why it happened. But again, you know, there, there is possibility of kind of this transnational quality there. But again, so what we see here is the Arab Spring and of course the Gezi protests actually speed up this reformation, state reformation process. And what we happen is, of course, this kind of stacking of loyalists, empowering alternative institutions, particularly the presidency. Uh, we can see that a lot of the concentration of foreign policy then goes to the presidency. We see then, of course, a split within the conservative coalition between the Gulen movement and, of course, the AKP. This obviously leads to the coup attempt in July 15th. And then from there, we have a complete purging of the state in academia, in military and bureaucracy, and we have a consolidation of the new state reformation processes in this idea of the executive presidency and, of course, new Turkey. And again, we see a complete opposite switch from back in the early days of state, re state reformation. We see the Kamala's coalition and those interest groups within it, as disparate as they are now, probably wouldn't call them the Kamala's coalition, but for this research to make it easier, we can see these groups are on the periphery now. The AKP is in control, but its own coalition is fractured. And then this means that it can't deal with the challenges that come up with foreign policy problems. So therefore, when we see, when there is a challenge to foreign policy, the AKP only has the structures that it is put in place, this executive presidential system, 
um, you know, this very kind of top-down model. We see sidelining of the kind of uh, the foreign ministry, and we see the we see the sidelining of the military um, until there's, of course, 2016 in Syria. We see a kind of bargain made with certain officers and certain kind of ideological uh, elements within the military. But fundamentally, what we see is that. Turkey, particularly under the AKP, with its new state reforms under the presidential system, is an inability to deal with crisis because the state has been stripped of its resources, it's been stripped of its expertise, and these alternative institutions don't have those longer-term historical uh, you know, flexibility and path dependencies to deal with crisis. So this is kind of where I get to the findings of the thing and to finish up here. Um, so what I'm doing, what I see is that we have drawing a causal narrative throughout Turkish foreign policy and its history, looking at it as a kind of historically changing object. We see the Turkish foreign policy formation is dominated by the same kind of relational relationships, these structures throughout its history. And this is dominated, of course, by like the Kamalist coalition with its military officers, its state bureau bureaucrats coming from this Kamala bloc up until the end of the Cold War. And then, of course, with the AKP really kind of really shifting those. But these relational relationships and structures are also imprinted on foreign policy formation and of course institutional reproduction. So we see these kind of go, these path dependencies throughout history. So what we see is actually the election of the AKP and fundamentally its pursuit of EU membership that changes this. It's not the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is a period that kind of shifts and accelerates these state reformation processes. But the EU membership allows the state and civil society to open up and engage in foreign policy and within the state, unlike other previous iterations throughout history. Now, what happens, though, instead of kind of a democratization of Turkey and, of course, of foreign policy, which initially started, there is a pursuit of institutional capture, similar to what the kind of coalition, the, the Kamala's coalition had done previously. We see foreign policy institutions are undermined and replaced and the expertise is sidelined. Um, this is shows definitely in the way that the, the inability of Turkey to promote its Turkish model um, and particularly its reactions as it goes on through Turkish foreign policy, like we see with Syria. Um, the inability to win and overthrow the Assad regime is also down to a failure to have a coherent policy in Turkey, um, in Syria. Um, and of course, a reactionary response. And this is because it shows there's not that expertise, there's none of that institutional strength and state capacity, which should be there from longer historical and longer kind of institutional uh, cementation. So fundamentally, we see the Arab Spring and its responses, kind of Gezi, speed up the state reformation processes that have been going underway since the EU membership bid. So state reformation is complete with the new presidential system and Turkish foreign policy is different in content because of the Arab Spring. So it's not institutionally has changed the state structure. It's different in content, but it lacks the state's uh, strong state capacity to successfully engage in global events. These are just some of the changes I've kind of just, you know, give you an idea of what I've been talking about. So I'm not going to go through them all, but it kind of gives you the idea that there has been this longer historical kind of changes that have gone on because that started off um, at the EU membership process. And then, of course, we see the institutional changes are part of this long term process. Um, but these new institution structures and now content of foreign policy has changed. And what this does, and this goes on to the last part of my thesis of my research, which I'm not going to explore today, it allows the adaptation of new foreign policy structures and new foreign policy objectives. So it allows the state, because of this empowering of alternative institutions, to engage with, for example, transnational actors like the Muslim Brotherhood, or engage and bring in for, you know, as we see with the violent non-state actors, we can see that the Syrian opposition is now in 2021 being used as a forward defense strategy in Turkish foreign policy. You know, the Syrian opposition uh, groups uh, and Islamist groups there are being brought into the Turkish state and used as an arm of the Turkish state in conflicts such as Libya and of course in like Azerbaijan and Armenia, Nagano-Karabakh conflict. So again, these kind of institutional changes that have gone on part of a longer term process allow these changes now. So the Arab Spring, of course, has changed the content, but these institutional path dependencies and reproduction of power have um, really changed uh, because of EU membership. So this is my new hypothesis, and I'll come to the end of my talk. So we can see that despite the huge effects of the Arabs of the Middle East region, the Arab Spring created 
The Arab Spring as an event did not dramatically influence Turkish foreign policy and state reformation processes. It accelerated these processes, um, but these were already underway with the EU membership, this other global event that happens here. So it may have not dramatically changed state reformation processes and the institutional structures, but it has changed the content of Turkish foreign policy. And this has allowed the AKP to reproduce its power and format new foreign policy objectives, these longer term state reformation processes, especially towards non-state actors and transnational actors. So violent non-state actors, the Muslim Brotherhood, and of course its engagement with Kurdish, renewed Kurdish political mobilization. Sorry. And so, yeah, of course you can see that's the next part of the thesis and the research that I'm doing. I'm exploring these, um, these ideas hopefully could be done at some other time and possibly in a paper um but that's it and uh thank you very much for listening to my talk and uh, i welcome any questions all right i grab a chair and sit down so those of you who are on zoom there's a q a button i think you can push to be able to um access that to kind of put your questions in and then I can field them uh, for Ian. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I had a, a couple of thoughts, questions, um, which is, I do think it's it definitely, uh, I followed the line of reasoning that there, the EU accession is, um, was actually in terms of, I'm gonna go back to maybe the ways that your scales interact uh, and, in, and also, so different pieces of that global and con contextual environment, and then the ways that that's creating different outcomes inside your case. Mm -hmm. uh, so on that, it makes sense that the kind of incentive structures and performance, the hoops, the hurdles, et cetera, the things that, that, that Turkey needs to do in terms of the process that the EU is laying out, sets up dynamics that in conjunction, I guess, with the domestic politics, with the, ex the rise of the AKP, it creates the kind of drivers for this kind of state reformation. Yeah. So what I don't, what I'd like you to make expand on more is how, because these two things kind of come together is the fact that the EU is, it, 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 this is more like intuitive sense that I would have is that the EU blocking Turkey on that path yeah. actually, you know, changes the pathway there. And these processes divert into different directions. And there's kind of like a, a bit of emerging in the broader Middle Eastern context, even pre-Arab Spring, like with the Gaza flotilla and Turkey already um, engaging in its, uh, I guess, I, you know, a, a non-EU uh, friendly or or co uh, um, <laughs> EU-approved sort of path. So it yeah. starts to create kind of that autonomy, and that then it seems like the the 2011 also just again kind of opens that up and yeah. into that so I, I mean I like at the end where you're making this distinction between the content of the policy and that's I guess maybe a little bit more precision just have you kind of work this out a bit for us yeah the content of the foreign policy versus what you're talking about as a reformation of the actual foreign policy decision making apparatus in Turkey yeah so maybe a couple of thoughts on that. yeah yeah sure um so thanks Jonathan so yeah look in terms of the EU ascension you are correct <laughs> that I didn't really cover it today, but basically that of course there's a relational dynamic there between the EU and um, the Turkey's pursuit of the EU membership. Of course, the consequences of the EU not allowing and making Turkey run through hoops also shifted the AKP's projection of like what it saw, the benefits of EU membership and therefore capturing states, institutions, these kind of things actually push that somewhat authoritarian trend in Turkey. But we can't not allow the EU to get away with you know, like people say, it's all Turkey becoming an authoritarian regime. Well, actually, no, it's also because of the EU's own issues and its own kind of domestic, you know, problems with Turkey during the EU that drove these kind of um, more radical kind of state reformation processes within Turkey, the shift away from this kind of democratization of the institutions. Could you maybe get... Uh periodize that a bit yeah. in the sense of like 2002 to when yeah. it started. That so was something say, I, I want, that was a piece that I wanted yeah, to okay. clarify. So we'd say about the EU membership process goes from about 2002 to 2007. Okay. That's the kind of key area where we see that. And then from there, we see 2007 onwards, the kind of rise of a more, again, with these empowering of different institutions within the Turkish state, this kind of shift in terms of um, different content is we see then from 2007 to 2000, 
and 10, 11 is of course this kind of zero problems with neighbors policy where we see Turkey shift its orientation away from um, Europe and then shifting its foreign policy towards the Middle East. And of course there, this is about as well being in a comfortable position within the state that it's allowing itself to enrich that we can go into political economy, you know, kind of argument here, but looking at enriching its own Anatolian base, its own part of the conservative coalition. Um, and it has the ability and the institutional and state capacity at that point to help it engage with that region in terms of pursuing economic kind of pursuits. So that's the, that's the, the area that we see the content change. Um, but this is, of course, again, there's these state reformation processes on that, of course, it can only be pursued economically. It's not pursued through, you know, attempts at diplomatic attempts and stuff like that are failures. For example, see what like 2010, Iran, Turkey and Brazil put forward a proposition for the Iran nuclear deal, which is then, of course, sidelined by the P5. So that kind of diplomatic strength is not there. Economically, it is because of larger long-term neoliberal reforms that have been going on in Turkey. Um, but in terms of kind of diplomatic strength, we can see that the shift in, in content and shift in, of course, these institutions starts to happen around, you know, it starts in 2002, but it really starts to take form in 2007 to 2010 period. But those institutions aren't strong enough. They aren't built up as we see when we get to the Arab Spring and the reaction that happens to that. And of course, with the reaction of the Arab Spring, we see that that therefore forces these institutions to take a stance and kind of build themselves up. Okay. Yeah. So that the the sort of uh, structural, the the deconstruction and then and re reformation, as you said, is there. The the infrastructural power is not there. The catalyst of the Arabs, but but, but the, the the reformation has happened in actually also the pivot, yeah. the sense of orientation post two thousand seven, yeah. and then the Arab Spring is more like an opportunity context that kind of like opens up the ability yeah. for them to build it, and up. it allows them to use these institutions which have been built up to then project this foreign policy. But again, you know, it's only. It doesn't have that diplomatic capability. It doesn't have that kind of strength. So it projects an ideological project yeah. as a way of, as a tool of foreign policy, rather than being a, you know, a, a multi-dimensional economic, you know, hard power, um, economic, you know, this kind of multi-dimensional foreign policy, which is important in engaging in those kind of crises. It projects an ideological project as a way of one inserting itself into the con into the, the revolutions, but also acting as a kind of then um, your model for the region, which then of course becomes a failure because it doesn't have that strong institutional strength and state capacity to actually put that in practice. Mm. Great, I got it. We have a question here from Eleanor Albert um, who asked uh, if you could speak to the timing of the European economic crisis mm -hmm. and its implications and the implications of the crisis perhaps leading to the EU model no longer being a paragon for Turkey in Turkey's reshaping and reorientation reorientation of its foreign policy. Yeah, and so I thank you, Elno, for that question. Um, I think it is a very important one to look at. Of course, the, the turbulence in Turkey-EU relations goes before the kind of, um, before the kind of global cri financial crisis in Europe. Uh, you know, there was a lot of issues that were happening in the EU, particularly about Turkey's membership, given its population, how much power it would have in the EU. Um, so there was all these hurdles that happened before that, but yeah, definitely the 2008 economic global financial crisis had a huge impact on seeing that maybe the EU model and of course its responses to that crisis is possibly not the best way forward for the AKP. Um, and again, that kind of brings around and I think kind of justifies the AKP, its, its, its engagement with the Middle East and this kind of Anatolian base, um, you know, exporting to these regions. Again, it's not very, like zero problems with neighbors is not a very you know, it's economically, it's, it's a burgeoning policy. It's not really like the strength. The EU is still, Turkey is still very dependent, even to this day on EU, the trade with the EU. It's its biggest trading partner. But again, I think in terms of the reaction, particularly between the kind of shift to right-wing politics and populism that came up there, you know, we can even still see to this day the kind of Turkey phobia that comes from the EU. You know, Boris Johnson, there was Brexit, you know, talking about like Turkey will join the EU, you know, these kind of discussions, you know, we saw it with Sarkozy as well, you know, we've seen it, you know, with other politicians that Turkey, particularly as a um, large Muslim country is kind of the, is, is a bait for own populist policies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, of course, I definitely think that the economic model and what happened 
particularly after GFC, who has played a part. Again, it's one of these kind of key events that's part of the EU membership process. It's mm -hmm. part of a longer term trajectory that happens there, I think. Yeah, I was I, really important to bring that up. I, I think the um, piece I was also wondering about is, so if you have that matrix of the EU side of the equation and, and like Eleanor bringing out as, a, as I didn't, also this hinge moment of a like 2007, 2008 build up prior to the Arab Spring, um, priming or just kind of setting up this trajectory that a potential trajectory that's then, then that, that it is that, uh, that trajectory then are there other ways that that gets turned or shifted over the course from 2011 forward? I guess I was specifically thinking of this period between, you know, January, December 2010, January 2011, through the Gezi protests, where Turkey's sitting in a certain position vis-a-vis mm. -vis the, the the regional upheaval that's happening, but yeah. that domestic side of it. So, because because and then it kind of keeps the relationality, right? It's sort of like the undending turtles going down that <laughs> the nested matryoshka dolls whatever the metaphor is because then it seemed like the eu thing keeps coming back in the with with the refugee crisis and in the ways that turkey's leveraging yeah. its position there and it's like it just feels like it keeps getting hard to disentangle these things so that was one thing i wanted to see if you could kind of walk us through the 11 to 13 then maybe 13 other it's kind of like a, this is a historian side of me yeah, yeah. historical sociologist he's like okay can we parse this a little bit in the sense of like also teasing out these junctures nested within your narrative. Yeah, of course. So look, you know, the, the kind of critical event of, um, and thanks for that question, Jonathan, because you're right, like, again, I can't, like, again, with the today, I, I wanted to kind of cover it as much as possible, but you're right, this kind of key juncture here, this key conjuncture of 2011, December to, of course, Gezi, is this kind of, again, this projection of this kind of um, Turkish model. This is when it kind of is the real kind of ideological projection of this. And of course, when these institutions are empowered for the first time to actually engage with the crisis. Um, so we, of course, when it comes to Turkey, when it comes to Egypt and Tunisia, it's a lot easier to project this and use these institutions um, and project this power and financial and ideological power because there's no real stake when it comes to Egypt and Tunisia. This is obviously a question when it comes to Libya. There's, of course, economic interests associated with Libya. Um, this, of course, then starts to shape the dynamics of this a lot more, uh, particularly the transnational understanding within the Turkish foreign policy establishment. And then we, of course, have the Syrian conflict. You know, Turkey doesn't even really have a reaction to other revolutions in the region. For example, Yemen, it doesn't really have a, you know, kind of stays out of Bahrain. It just kind of says, OK, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like, but again, then Syria happens. And this is when we kind of have this shift really happen. And this is when we see the failure of that ideological policy because you know Turkey's institutional, these new kind of institutions that created and these relational structures then shift to allow it to then engage in kind of military engagement with them. Um, and then of course, Gezi is that blowback to that. And Gezi of course, really puts the final nail in the coffin for the kind of the Turkish model in the region because it, you know it's about promoting democracy. It's about promoting kind of the protests and free, and the ability to, to question these kind of authoritarian leaders, but then Turkey, of course, because of these reactions to the state reformation processes that have been ongoing, the reactions to this basically nullify the Turkish model, this kind of idea of having a strong conservative Muslim democracy with a strong economy, um, when you're basically heavy police presence and brutality against some citizens. Mm -hmm. So yeah, again, this is a very <laughs> conjunctural part, but again, this helps us shift between this idea of kind of ideological, the failure of ideological power, infrastructural power, to then, of course, shifting to more kind of more stronger military. And of course, creating, I didn't get time to kind of talk about the creation of institutions outside this, particularly like the, uh, you know, the empowerment of the police, the empowerment of the gendarmerie, these kind of alternatives to the military that are then, you know, and particularly the intelligence agencies, the intelligence agencies are used to then promote power and promote military programs and support jihadist groups and opposition groups in Syria, not the military. It's only 2016 mm -hmm. that we see the military brought back in and only certain elements of the military brought back in there. 
I want to remind you, if anybody has questions, pop them in, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I have, I have, you know, a running, <laughs> list, so I'll keep going, yeah. but, but definitely jump in. So what I wanted to shift to uh, is uh, to bring the cards in, mm -hmm. in two ways, which would be your story does not have the 2003 invasion of Iraq in it. Mm -hmm. So there's that piece, with, does the does U.S. intervention in the region in the middle of that early phase of AKP's evolution and power play into it, but then the, then the, the other piece of that uh, being just the the Syrian, but but bringing in a, across the the the, the south, southern southeastern border of, of Turkey, the internal dynamics that are happening with the move towards a detente or or a you know a kind of ceasefire and then that falling apart 2016. So just narrating that side of it. Um, mm -hmm. From the Kurdish areas into what you've been talking about on this broader level. Okay, so just to repeat that, you're looking to see, particularly with 2003, the Iraq War. Well, I guess it's, they're separate. They're yeah. separate and connected. So one would just be, yeah, discreetly, does 2003 make that much difference in the in your broader narrative? Yeah. But then the transformations that are happening with the emergence of the Kurdish regional government um, and just the evolution of the yeah. PKK's evolving strategies and obviously um, with Rojava in post 2011, yeah. just all of these dynamics that kind of concatenate. Yeah. And then uh, 2016, et cetera, and then afterwards. Yeah, so look, in terms of like, for the broader Middle East, the 2003 Iraq war had massive implications for, you know, what the rise of, even today, like the rise of ISIS and of course the Kurdish political mobilization. Um, for Turkey, in this analysis, not so much. You know, the AKP voted to, well, they were, pushing for engaging with the Americans, uh, but then they were overturned by their own parliamentarians. So there was not really, there's not really much scope for looking at the Iraq war in this thesis and this research. Um, but in terms of course, the Kurdish, and that's what's really interesting is what I look at, particularly in my next part of my research, um, is that for a long time, the AKP um, was able as part of its coalition to be able to bring in more conservative Kurds. You know, it, it brought around the Kurdish question and brought it forth as a cultural issue rather than a political issue. And this for a long time formed a large electoral base of its, of its um, ability to form power and form majority within the Turkish, public, um, Turkish parliament. Um, so this kind of, this, and at that time as well within Iraq, you know, we see that the AKP actually engages with uh, particularly the Barzani government with the KDP um, and the KRG. So, you know, it's a version to kind of the politicization of the Kurdish issue. Um, you know, we actually see it engage in transnational kind of engagement with, you know, trade relations, particularly, particularly in the Davutoglu area in 2007 to 2010, we see a really strong relationship building with KRG. So again, this kind of idea that the AKP is consistently anti-Kurdish, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not a true. There's, you know, it's been very supportive. But then, of course, you know, we we can we can trace the kind of the rise of Kurdish political mobilization until the AKP's failure in, in 2015 election. Um, this is when you finally see a large percentage of those kind of Kurds that are part of its conservative coalition shift away into, of course, again, I call it the Kurdish coalition, which is another abstraction. Again, these things are so amorphous, but again, we see interest groups shape there and vote for the head of the People's Democratic Party, the AKP. Um, and this is when we start to see, and this aligns as well with the political mobilization in Turkey with Rojava. Uh, Rojava. Um, you know, early on, Erdogan actually met with uh, the leaders of the PYD. But then this, of course, becomes a challenge to the institutional reproduction of the AKP's power because they lose the election. And then fundamentally from there, they re-securitize the Kurdish issue as a means of empowering certain institutions. Uh, you know, they empower, of course, certain elements within the military. It keeps them busy from, of course, engaging in any coup activity. That doesn't actually help as we see what happens. Um, you know, of course, we see the PKK, um, the end of the PKK peace process. So again, 2015 is probably the critical moment that we see that shift. And then, of course, then the institutions and the reproduction of power, because of the challenges that, let's say, a, uh, the PKK poses, of course, the head AP poses, this Kurdish bloc to the AKP's institutional control of power. This allows the, the, the kind of remilitarization, resecuritization of the Kurdish issue. And, of course, then it allows 
these other institutions to be empowered to engage in transnational kind of military power across the thing. Again, this is because of a failure in foreign policy institutions, the inability to, to, to engage in diplomacy and the kind of isolation, regional isolationism that happens is that the Kurdish issue becomes a domestic issue again. It's not a, it's, it's viewed through a domestic lens rather than a kind of transnational issue. And therefore its responses uh, isolate Turkey in the international and global arena, rather than being able to, to put its case towards the, the global and say, well, actually these are an existential threat to us. Mm -hmm. You know, this hence why the use of military power similar as, you know, again, like the Kamaz coalition did to the Kurdish issue. So again, we see these kind of, not institutional reproductions, but these kind of historical reproductions throughout mm -hmm. Turkish history, in particular the Turkish state. I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering about two things. You can either, you could pick one or answer both or whichever you feel better with. Um, one is in recent Turkish history, I feel like we've seen sort of along with Trump in the US, this rise of the idea of like the global strong man. And I'm wondering if that was sort of, if we can trace that historically in the AKP and in Erdogan, or if that is a newer, like they sort of saw that as a thing they could latch onto and gain power from or reproduce power from. Mm -hmm. The next thing, which I think is separate, but maybe related, um, I only knew about the Gulen movement as um, the AKP sort of fighting it. I wasn't aware that they used to sort of be part of that or work together. So I'm just curious sort of what happened there. <laughs> yeah. So look, the global strongman thing, you know, this is this is because I'm a Turkey person, but yeah. actually, you know, throughout Turkish history, Turkish political parties are really dominated by kind of strong leadership figures. And it's a very kind of authoritarian. And there's actually a book coming out by Dr. Tezcan Gumush that kind of looks at these kind of patterns throughout history, that actually Turkish political institutions, electoral politics is actually very authoritarian. But we can see that actually populism, this kind of rise of the global strongman, and again, this is my bias as a Turkish person, <laughs> actually had its kind of beginnings in Turkey, you know? And I yeah. think a lot of these kind of global strongmen get a lot of, uh, you know, and even Trump emulated For sure. Erdogan as well. So you could, you know, the populism that came out of Turkey could be kind of seen as the critical, you know, the reaction, particularly in the post 2008 GFC, but, you know, Erdogan has been accused of being an authoritarian within his own party. And, you know, we can see that even in the post in the EU process period, him dismantling the kind of democratic structures within the AKP. So, yeah, I think the that it's actually a longer historical trajectory that's that's very prominent within Turkish politics. Um, Erdogan is just, of course, the epitome of that now and is probably the most successful in creating again, creating a state that allows him to be that global strong man and reproduce his own authoritarian power. Um, in terms of the Gulen movement, yeah, the, it's a really interesting one. You know, the Gulen movement has been a kind of a uh, transnational education movement for a long time. Um, it again, was part of that, again, I use that conservative coalition, um, but it's, you know, it was kind of one of the main initial kind of foreign policy tools for this conservative coalition. It allowed them to, um, engage in educational institutions and of course in the Central Asia there is of course Gulen, there was Gulen schools excuse me all over Africa and around the world um, and there was of course a time when these they had a huge say in kind of educational policy a lot of these kind of what I was talking about the kind of the inclusion of this conservative coalition actually allowed Gulen members into areas like diplomacy into the judiciary well, these are young educated people, but they come through the Gulen movement. So then, you know, when you have this kind of spat that happens in about 2000, it's about 2012, and it's because of actually the Kurdish issue, um, because of the kind of reconciliation between the AKP and the PKK, there's a, there's a split there. And of course, taking over institutions and where power lies between in the conservative, you have kind of a two heads start to pop up in the in the um, in the conservative coalition. So this means that there is a, there's of course a battle and a split. And the AK and the Gula movement made the very bad move right now in looking historically of challenging Erdogan and accusing him of corruption. Um, you know, and of course videotaping, well not videotaping, but recording these kind of things in the and this of course, you know, was the kind of final death knell. This kind of brought around this kind of institutional struggle. Um, power struggle between these two things, which eventually also drove those kind of state reformation processes, the shift to kind of authoritarianism within Turkey. So yeah, we only look at the Gulen movement now as a kind of a 
as the kind of the arch nemesis of, of, of the AKP and of Turkey. And they've done that very well, particularly using this, like I remember being in Turkey and, and hearing it change from, in terms of linguistically from the parallel state, parallel to Devlet parallel to the Feto, which is just a, you know, the Fetula Gulen, uh, Fetula terrorist organization. You know what I mean? It's this, it's this very linguistically changing, and you know, the AKP has been very good at, at naming other mm. others and opposition mm. groups as terrorists, mm. and it's very good at creating these kind of, you know, whoever made up the Feto thing is, uh, you know, it, it got adopted by linguistically throughout all Turkey, and even now in the way it's it's discussed. So, but they they were allies for a long time in undermining the Kamala's control of power. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Ian. It's really fascinating. It's good to see that kind of a wrap up of, of a lot of the work you've been completing um, and excited to see it come out. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. And thanks very much for having me. Let's go.